invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll make sure when we're all done here we'll say a special prayer just for Bible study. So uh, I'm going to read verses 10 through 20 in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change. chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Now Paul wrote a good chunk of the New Testament, and in the book of 2 Corinthians, he says that we Christians don't wage war the way the world does. Now we're largely familiar with the way the world wages war. They take up arms, they shoot and bomb each other until one side surrenders, and or until the other side finishes off uh, the other side, they take prisoners, they take land, they interrogate, they search for intelligence, they try desperately to win while playing by some semblance of rules. Yes, even in war, there are rules. Right? But over the years, we've seen how many of the bad guys, and so we'll just call them bad guys now, find ways to either circumvent the rules or outright ignore them in order to gain an advantage. And I guess all's fair in love and war, if that's true, then there are no rules to war, it's just whoever wins. But it gets hard when we can see that one side tries hard to play by the rules and the other side completely ignores them. You know, and that's annoying when you're playing with little kids, and that's annoying when you're playing with big little kids, right? And so if, it, it'd be very hard to win at anything if we're trying to play by the rules and our opponent doesn't think that there are any rules. The ironic thing is, it's the world who wants to make all the rules. Then it's the world who wants us to play by the rules, while they can ignore them, if they want to. The bottom line is that worldly people constantly find different and innovative ways to wage war. And they play to win at all costs. It's also not as easy as it used to be to discern. You know, back in the day when it was David versus Goliath, it was pretty easy to tell where the battle line was. Right? David eventually ran to the battle line. It was pretty clear. It's mano y mano. It's me against you, man. Winner takes off. Right? And it was pretty clear who to tell who the winner was. Very clear. Fast forward quite a bit to World War II. It was pretty easy to see who the combatants were there, too. There was, there was the people who were bent on destruction. There were people who were bent on trying to keep people from destruction. After we figured things out after 9-11, it was pretty clear who the combatants were, but it started to change and become harder to figure out. Because all of a sudden, the combatants weren't wearing uniforms. They didn't look like soldiers. They looked like regular people. You know, and um, when we figured things out today, it isn't as much about taking off arms and trying to defeat other people. There's still ways you can war that way, but today it seems to be about one side imposing their views on another side. They don't shoot at us, per se, but they are seeking to destroy us. If we don't follow along with what they want us to think, they hate us and they try to destroy us as Christians. It should be clear by now that our battle is different than conventional war. Our enemy isn't another country. It's not a group of insurgents held up in a particular town. Our enemy is the devil. He's behind all that nonsense. I mean, it doesn't, the nonsense is going to change. It's going to come and go. But the man, the, the, the devil is behind all the nonsense. That's not going to change. And we're not going to destroy the enemy by bombing strategic targets, taking prisoners, interrogating them to get information, and use that intelligence to go after more of the bad guys until eventually we bring down the devil himself. It's just not going to work that way. Paul tells us in today's scripture to be strong in the Lord 
and in his mighty power. Because we have something special in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have his mighty power. All right? He's already defeated Satan. See, that's the good news. He's dealt him the death blow. But we still have to fight the battles and be strong. Because remember, it's the same way as when the Israelites came into the promised land. It was all theirs, wasn't it? The Lord had given it to them. The, the, the battle had been won. But the, the war had been won. But there were still battles to fight work there. Because there were people in the land the Israelites had to win. They had to fight the battles. It was theirs, but they had to take it. They still had to battle. And the battle was just beginning. And do you remember what the Lord said to Joshua? In chapter 1, verse, in verses 6 and verse 7 and verse 9, what did he say? Be strong. Same thing Paul saying in, in, in the scripture today. Be strong, the Lord will be with you. That's one thing you can take to the bank. The Lord will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That doesn't mean we won't choose to ignore him sometimes. And then wonder what happened to him. When he didn't change, we did. Right? Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Paul tells me to be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Jesus has brought us to the promised land. He has brought us to where we need to be, but now we have a battle to fight. And Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. You're going to need it all to fight against the devil's schemes because the devil's a schemer. Every time God sent His people out with a specific task, He equipped them and told them what to do. From Adam and Eve, all the way back in the beginning, Adam and Eve, who were commanded to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. There was something wrong with the earth that needed subdued. There was, there, was, there was a problem. Adam and Eve had to subdue it. So Paul tells his readers, and he's telling us today, to put on the full armor of God so we can stand against the devil's schemes. I am infinitely thankful that the Lord sends us out. I'm equally thankful that he sends us out with armor of God. The armor of God. The devil's schemes that Paul mentions are challenging. Paul tells us our struggles not against flesh and blood. I realize nine times it looks that way. Sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes it feels like our biggest problems are certain a certain person or maybe certain people. But our problem isn't with flesh and blood. You see the things, you see things, you hear things that make your teeth stand on edge, and you think that some people need to get their act together, but our struggle is actually against the powers, as Paul said, of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, there are, there are heavenly beings out there that are working for our good. There are angels watching over me, my Lord. We can sing about it. God uses angels to protect us. And many times we can see he uses angels to, to, to tell people messages. Remember Joseph and Mary. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and told them things. These angels bring peace every time. An angel like that shows up in the Bible every time. The person may be a little bit scared at first. What's the angel say? Peace. Well, there are others who don't bring peace. Spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm, Paul says. These are spiritual beings that are not holy. They have lost their place in heaven and now work with the devil to bring destruction. These are the liars who come and tell you things that aren't true. And one of the things, one of the biggest rules the world sets up the, the rule that they want us to follow, that they don't want to follow, is you can't call somebody else a liar. Well, you know what? If somebody lies and they lie consistently, guess what that makes them? Makes them a liar. You know? Makes, and, and Satan's a liar. There are some people who don't know how to tell the truth. They are liars. They are from the devil. They'll tell you anything and everything to keep you from drawing closer to Jesus. They're liars, they're cheaters, and they're stealers. Stealers with an E-A. Bent on destroying God's children. They'll tell you not to judge while they constantly judge. They'll tell you it's wrong to tell someone they're wrong, but they're not wrong to tell you that you're wrong. They'll tell you to listen to all the voices while they show no respect for what Jesus says. It's like I said earlier, they want to make the rules that others have to live by and they don't. And that's not new. I, I realize we can look around and we can see a lot of that. That's not really new. That's just, uh, just looks different. But God is good. Isn't that, isn't that, God's a good God. He gives us what we need to stand firm. He's given us this armor. And every piece is important. Every piece is like a piece of armor that have been very familiar with. We're going to get familiar with that this week. We're going to see pictures, I mean, of armor. And when you think of an armor, you're thinking of a knight. You're thinking of a, a medieval 
15th century knight, you know, that with the with the helmet and the, all the clank clank, you know, the, that, that's what you're thinking of. A helmet, a breastplate, belt, shoes of some sort, boots, shield, a sword. You can probably imagine, as you can probably imagine, believe it or not, I can relate this to baseball. I mean, just not really baseball, can I? <laughs> Play just the baseball. When I play baseball, I usually play catcher. I didn't bring it all with me today, but the catcher wears the most equipment. And it's the same kind of stuff. There's a helmet, there's a chest protector, there's a belt of sorts. Protection for your feet and legs. A shield, which we go with glove. And there's a sword when you get the, not for, not for defense, but the swords when you want the bat, that's your bat. It's a collection of pieces that function as a unit. And much of the armor is for protection. Armor is for protection. I gotta tell you. When you take a foul ball right off the mask that you're wearing, you can read the label on the ball, you're really glad it didn't hit you right there. Because that would have hurt. You know what I mean? I've never taken a foul ball off the face. I have taken them off of other parts. But it hurts when you get hit and it misses the armor. That's why we got to have the armor on and have it on right. <clears throat> the armor's for protection. Any type of padding for any type of activity is designed for your protection. And it's important. God's armor is no different. We have certain pieces for defense to protect us. Then there's one very important piece for offense. We need this armor because our enemy is real, very powerful, very wicked, very cunning, and very active in the world today. And he relies on us. He relies on, I don't know how many things, three or four things. He relies on manipulation, twisting and distorting things to gain ground. How often do you see things manipulated? People can even manipulate their sentence, your sentence. They can video you saying something, edit out certain words, make it look like you said something totally different. And it makes you scratch your head. Uh, wonder why people do that. He seeks to intimidate by making us afraid to go on the offense. He doesn't want us to use our sword of the Spirit. He doesn't want us to proclaim the Word of God. He wants to control and dominate every part of everyone's life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll do anything to get there. There are no rules in the kingdom of darkness. None. They don't play by rules. The kingdom of darkness, the realm of evil, those bent on evil, don't care what the rules are. And if they can get us to follow them, well, they don't. Well, then guess what? We just got duped and fell for a devil's scheme. You know, Chuck Swindoll, I like Chuck Swindoll. He put it this way, and I agree with him. He says, whenever you see manipulation by intimidation for the purpose of domination, it's from the enemy. Now sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's hard to discern what's coming from the enemy and what's not. But that's an easy one. <clears throat> if it's being manipulated, if you're being intimidated, if you're if they're very handy to dominate, that's not what Jesus told us to do. Jesus didn't tell us to manipulate and intimidate. You know, uh, he's told us to proclaim the truth. I mean, it's everywhere. Manipulation by intimidation for the purpose of domination. That's what they want. <clears throat> As Christians, though, we have a way. We put on the armor of God. Each piece protects a part of our body that's important. And each piece has spiritual power. The helmet's for salvation, right? For saved. That's, that's one of the most important things you can be, is saved. And your helmet protects your head. Because this is where you do your thinking. Isn't it? This is where you make up your mind. This is where you determine A or B. What are you going to do? And salvation ought to help you determine that. The breastplate's for righteousness. You know what? Uh, the belt is for truth. That's my favorite part. Your belt holds up your pants, doesn't it? That's kind of important. You hold your pants up. The truth holds up our lives. Once you throw out the truth, you stand a good chance, I'm pun intended here, very pun intended, getting caught with your pants down. Right? No belt, no pants. Your feet fitted with the gospel, fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith. Paul says in Romans 13, this isn't the only place we talk about the armor. Paul says in Romans 13 to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses the same Greek word here for putting on the armor of God. Liking it to getting dressed. Clothe yourself in the You all got dressed this morning. I can tell. And you all look very nice. But are you clothed with the armor of God? Obviously we're not talking about a literal suit of body armor. But each day we face the wiles of the devil and we need our protection. My favorite song has a line in it that says, Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on the prayer. Put on the armor then is to put on Christ himself. 
Meaning that we should be so wrapped up in Jesus, people would not see us, but they would see Jesus living through us. And then, then, and only then, we'd be able to stand against the devil. In, in our own strength, we can't do it. If you don't believe me, just try it. Yeah, just, just, just try it. It's, it's one of those things. Satisfaction guarantee you your money back. And I guarantee you, you can't stand up under your own strength. I can't give you your money back. <laughs> because it's uh, because this armor stuff, it's, it's free. It's free. Except you're willing to do it. You know, only Christ living in us. Clothing us, if you will. Will enable us to walk in the Spirit. And when the day of evil comes, when the day of evil comes, when evil starts to really go, we'll be able to stand our ground. It's at this point then we can take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and go on the offensive. Not to be offensive, but to be on the offensive. There's a difference. We can proclaim the Word of God boldly to draw others closer to Jesus. Because remember, struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. That's who we're battling against. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so the day of evil comes. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, Paul says, to stand. Can you stand it? And as we prepare for communion this morning, we're going to come, we're going to do like we did last month. Those, those that are in the, the drive-in have their bread, they have their juice. We'll take it at the appropriate time, but um, Cindy's just going to come play. We're not going to try to sing the communion at the same time because we were we were done singing. At the, uh, so we'll, Cindy will come and she'll play, and then we'll sing the closing song. But as you prepare, as you take the body, as you take the blood of Christ, put on the armor. Keep on the armor so that you're able to stand. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for, for equipping us. Lord, you didn't send us out there into the world of, of crazy, with evil, people trying to steal, kill, and destroy. You didn't send us out there unprepared. You sent us out there very prepared. Lord, you've given us everything that we need. Lord, from truth to salvation to righteousness to, to the gospel, Lord, to to, to faith, for everything we need, you've given us your word. You've given us all that we need. Help us to use it. To use it wisely, to use it uh, correctly, to be in the spirit, to be with you. Lord, fill us with your spirit always. In your name. Amen.